to be American? Yeah. Are you ready to take back America? Yeah. My father didn't come here to Ellis Island in 1929 to give this country to China. And I'm sure your parents and grandparents said this now, right? You know, when you look at what's happening today, it makes you sick. We're in a state today that is dysfunctional. Look what's happening with COVID. Look at the corruption. Big shots, I don't want to mention names, are now being put in jail for doing stupid things. Laws are being passed finally, and yet they're not strong enough. We need accountability at all levels. Without accountability, what are you going to get? More corruption, more manipulations, more finagling. This country is too great for that, and this state is too great for that. You know, I think about Ronald Reagan. You remember Ronald Reagan? Yeah. Yeah. Good man, right? You probably don't remember, word for word, his great speech at the Republican conventions when he took on Jimmy Carter. And he faced off to that malaise, you remember? Yeah. And he said about government, great definition of government programs. He said the closest thing to eternal life in Washington is a government program. Once they're in, you can't get them out. And it's the same thing with taxes. Once they put a tax on, oh, it's just going to be temporary. Did you ever see a temporary tax? Liar. They keep adding to it. So we got, you know, really big problems. I remember Ronald Reagan. I'm a human rights activist. I help the people in the Balkans. My wife Shirley who's here. Thank you, Shirley, for coming. She's in the back. My son John is here, and I hope you say hello to them because later, if you didn't get it yet, you want to get the update on my book, Unaccountable Congress. Here it is. This is the book I wrote 17 years ago. I was like pro a prophet, Jeremiah. I told you on chapter 4. You know what the title of chapter 4 is? The Big Apple and Washington, one bailout after the other. I predicted that we would be insolvent. I couldn't believe, I can't believe today we're in the shape we are in. I'm going to take you through the numbers. Don't forget, maybe you don't know it. I'm the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House or Senate. Can you imagine that? When I got there, I was shocked to find so many attorneys and not one other accountant. So no one's counting, but everybody's spending. And they're spending money they don't have. So what do you do when you spend money you don't have? You've got to borrow it. And who are we borrowing from today? China. Countries that don't share our values, like China. We're putting this country on a course of unsustainability. And it's not just for our kids, it's for us. It's not 50 years away, it could be five years away. Look at the debt that's being racked up on the books. Obama himself has said in the next 10 years, he expects to add 10 trillion, that's with a T, 10 trillion to the 12 trillion we just ended the last fiscal year with. That's 22 trillion. Now, even if you could keep interest rates down to 5%, which I don't believe you can because the Federal Reserve has put so much money out there, and we've kind of gained the system by keeping interest rates artificially low. So what we're doing, and I know we have to do that to keep the economy from really cratering, but what's the plan to come out of it? More spending? That means you're going to have huge inflation. You remember when Ronald Reagan gave that speech? Who remembers that the interest rate, the prime rate, was 21%? I remember. How could anybody pay 21%? That's because inflation was 18%. So you have to always compensate people for lending money by going 2 or 3 percent above inflation. Now, get back to my point. I don't think we're going to be able to keep interest rates down to 5 percent. But let's say we were able to do that. In 10 years, at 5 percent, 22 trillion dollars, and that's the good news, that's what's on the books. Social Security and Medicare, yeah, 45 trillion more are off the books, and that's what I say over here. But talk about the bonded debt. 22 trillion times 5%, that's over a trillion dollars in interest. That means all discretionary spending will be pushed out. That's the worst tax in the world. You don't have to worry about taxes if you're paying that kind of interest. And look who are we sending it to? A lot of it's going offshore. We've got to wake up. This is not rocket science. This is accounting. It's not even difficult math. But you get confused every day by these politicians that want to seduce you into thinking they have a program. They have no program. 
It reminds me of the little story that I heard about that little frog they put in a tank of water and they raised the temperature every day a quarter of a degree. So imperceptible, it's felt nice and warm. Guess what happened to that frog? It boiled to death. Did not know enough to jump out. You have to be the people in America today that sound the alarm so that things happen. We don't want to boil to death with what's coming. Now, look what I put on the cover of this book 17 years ago. I left Congress in 1989, and you might say, well, Joe, why aren't you still in Congress? Don't you remember my races? Don't you remember Bella Rabson, who came from the West Village to West Chester? I had to retire her in 1986. I had the most liberal, democratic district, maybe in America. They got just district. When I said I was going to run Eve Arthur Anderson after 22 years, you know what the people told me? You're crazy. You haven't been in politics. How could you win? That district? you got to be kidding. I took my immigrant parents on both arms and walked on every uh, corner into every store and some bars in Yonkers, <laughs> and I got every ethnic Democrat you can think of in all those Reagan Democrats. Irish, Italian, Portuguese, Polish, Ukrainian. They understood my message. Because they understood I was the son of immigrants who worked in his grocery, my father's grocery store and mother. She worked there too until we moved to Westchester in 1957. And then I became Joey the waiter at a country club around the corner from where we lived. And then I went to intern in Arthur Anderson, became a partner only 10 years later. Thank God my father and mother, who had no education, sent me to good judgment schools, Ford of Prep, and Ford of University, so I could speak a little bit better than they could. My dad spoke broken English. And, but what does that tell you? That's not about me. That's about America. Anybody in America can succeed. Anybody. And why am I saying that? Because we have to keep this country as the greatest opportunity society that it was and still is today. But you're not going to do it if we're going to fritter away our capital and borrow money from others. So here's what I put on the book as a warning 17 years ago. This is a congressman's credit card. It's a congressman's voting card. I'm holding it. See? By the way, if those of you want some copies of this book, I brought some. But more important, I brought the update. I bridged 17 years ago to today to show you it's much, much worse than I could have ever believed 17 years ago. But here it is. My congressman's voting card, the first chapter of this book. The most expensive credit card in the world is a congressman or congresswoman's voting card. Why? Because every time they put it in the computer to vote, they're pushing up the national debt. That's why we have deficits. So what do I put here? <coughs> credit line, unlimited. Expiration date, never. Built to future generations. Here it is. That's what's going on today. 